Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Cinema of the German Film Museum, Film Institute. I'm very happy that so many of you came to join us in the continuation of our series, Lecture in Film, dedicated to the work of Chantal Ackermann. As you all know, we started last October and um, we have been going through a series of lectures. Um, if you missed any of the lectures, by the way, they're all available on YouTube, so you can check out our YouTube channel from the Film Museum. And as you also know, we're going to continue the program until July this year. and. Don't, uh, to make sure you don't miss any of the next lectures, you can check out the program in our flyer or on the internet in our website made specifically for this series, www.chantal-ackermann.de. You can check out the whole program and as you might also already know, on top of the lecture programs, uh, we also have some accompanying uh, films. Uh, we're also um, showing again, screening again some of the films we are having here in the lectures. And in this month of January, I would like to call attention to two screenings that we're having as this part of this accompanying program. Um, we are showing Nuit et Jour uh, from Chantal Ackermann, one of her films that is unfortunately not in the lecture series, but we have already screened it once. It's going to be screened again this Saturday, 19th of January at 6 p.m. Um, and there I would like to just let you know we have a little um, mistake in the program, in the printed program of the Film Museum. It says it's with English subtitles, but we're actually showing it with German subtitles. So there's a little mistake in there. Sorry for that. Uh, we're also screening Histoire d'Amérique, um, also with uh, German subtitles next Wednesday, uh, January 23rd, also at 6 p.m. Um, and also don't forget that next week we already have the next lecture with uh, Shen Seinberg and the film Tutu Nui next Thursday. So if you want to um, get to see lots of Chantal Ackermann in the next days, have a look at our monthly program from the Film Museum to get all these other uh, appointments as well. But let's go to the program of tonight. We're very happy, we're delighted that Tim Griffin made it to Frankfurt for this lecture. He will be introduced by Professor Vincent Schrediger in a moment. Um, and uh, after Tim's uh, lecture, we'll have, as always, a short break of 10 minutes. Then we're going to screen the film suit. And afterwards, we have a Q&A. So stick around. And I hope we're going to have a nice discussion afterwards. Enjoy the film, enjoy the lecture, and thanks for coming. Hello, and good evening from uh, my side. Um, if you uh, read our program flyer and our program description closely, you will have noticed that uh, we make the bold claim that Chantal Ackermann was not only an accomplished filmmaker and writer, but also a pioneer of uh, film installation art. And if you look at uh, Chantal Ackermann's oeuvre catalog, and actually we sort of make the claim that she started uh, thinking along the lines of film installations in her work in the, in the 1970s. If you look at her catalog, you will find out that uh, the, the actual film installation work starts uh, much later. But our claim is actually based on a story that uh, Eric de Kauper uh, once told me, um, a story from the 1970s. Chantal Ackermann had just made um, Les Rendez-vous d'Anna, which is, was a film involving trains. And she was approached by the Centre Pompidou in Paris, by the film department, who wanted to commission a film from her on trains. And uh, Jean Talacarman responded by saying, well, I've just done a film on trains and I don't feel like making another one right now, but I would be interested in doing a film installation. And the response from the Centre Pompidou was a what? <laughs> and then she tried to explain what she had in mind and they said, we don't do that. So it took another 20 years, and the encounter with people who would see eye to eye with her on what a film installation was and could achieve uh, for her to become a visual artist or transition into the art world. And one of the people who was instrumental in making that transition possible and in uh, making uh, Chantal Ackermann uh, uh, fully explore her potential as a visual artist and not just as a filmmaker is our guest tonight, Tim Griffin. Uh, Tim Griffin has been a uh, very influential writer on art and a curator uh, working mostly in New York for the last 25 years. Um, he actually has a, an MFA, uh, a Master's in Fine Arts and Poetry from, from Bard College, and uh, he was a 
art critic and writer for, and curator for most of the 90s. In 2003, uh, he became the editor of Art Forum, which, uh, as most of you will know, is one of the most influential publications on contemporary visual arts uh, in the world. And uh, since uh, 2010, I think, right? He moved directly to Kitchen. He has been the executive director and chief curator of one of the key sites of uh, New York's uh, contemporary uh, performing visual and uh, um, also music art scenes, uh, namely Kitchen. Um, in his capacity as director of Kitchen, he has uh, uh, organized exhibitions and performances by uh, important contemporary visual artists and performance artists such as Aoki Sasamoto, Martin Subotnik, Dan Vo, and of course, um, in several instances, Chantal Ackerman. Um, to have Tim here, to have someone who can introduce us to one facet of Chantal Ackerman's work from the perspective of someone who's worked with her in a field that she was already passionate about early on in her career is a particular privilege. And I'm really grateful to Tim that he made his way here to Frankfurt to uh, introduce us to Sud tonight. Thank you so much, Tim, for coming. And please welcome together with me, Tim Griffin. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much um, for having me here this evening. And there's so much history, actually, with Chantal that comes to mind even as you as you speak. Um, you know, some of which I could talk about in the Q and A um, after, and I'm sure as I, as I speak, other things might come to mind. But in the meantime, I definitely wish to thank Consens, Laura, and the Film Museum uh, for this generous invitation to discuss uh, Chantal and more specifically to discuss Sud. Um, I'm going to apologize about the format of some of these images, as well as my pronunciation. I am sure that uh, you'll take home some tidbits from me. Um, why I hadn't seen this particular film for a number of years, I'd always valued the work for how it captures Chantal's politics, and moreover, her unique ability to insert herself into unlikely and very intimate you know, settings. You know, on a personal level, she had a disarming you know, forthrightness. Um, if you could start the first slide. Yeah, as the story goes, uh, Chantal was planning a film about William Faulkner South when she heard about the horrific lynching of James Byrd in the small town of Jasper in East Texas, and she immediately turned her attention to the matter and traveled there. I'll let you know, people in the film uh, tell the story more fully, but having abandoned her original project, this single filmmaker and Sud is able to speak with people ranging from the local sheriff in his office to a local witness in his living room and then record Bird's memorial with his family's blessing with a roaming vantage that reaches the foot of a country church's you know, pulpit. Yeah, I'd also appreciated the film uh, for its sense of time or temporality, its slowness depicted, which was meaningful to me as somebody with a bit of a background in rural United States. You can tell from some of the exterior imagery how Ackerman might have mi redirected midstream from making her film about Faulkner and about a southern landscape saturated with experience. The meaning and implication of single shots would easily have been recast, retaining a different significance by context. I want to return to this. Um, yet when I went back for this on this occasion, I was struck by how difficult the film is to watch. Um, as we're forced to recall how our present extends so deeply into the past. We still occupy that place, ostensibly distant. And so time seems unsettled. In many ways, the film feels more present in its focus than it was during the time of its making in 1999. And the film is palpably present for underlining how the stillness of these southern landscapes in Ackerman's lens is mirrored by the stillness of unchanging time and culture. And throughout the film, this disarming sense is, I think, amplified as it contains so much insistence and so many rehearsals of how things have changed. People who say things no longer, at, were, no longer are as they were, or that this particular event will act as a catalyst, finally creating an irre irreversible change that the awful fate of James Byrd will be remembered forever that this lynching is but one incident within the slow arc of history that bends toward justice, that denotes progress, even if in, in its awful 
familiar character. Indeed, such a fundamental contradiction of time and stillness, I think, is staged by Ackerman at the very outset of Sud. I'm thinking of the railroad cars at an intersection whose slow passage seems interminable. One can't see the beginning or end, and so cannot locate oneself in the grammar of its sequence or better chronology. One cannot know when it will fully come to pass. In this regard, I think of one uh, passage uh, isolated by Sartre in his critical essay on Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. Quote, the train swung around the curve and they passed smoothly from sight that way with that quality of shabby and timeless patience of static serenity. Accordingly, the car in Ackerman's film going down the hill in this scene just turns around rather than wait for the train to clear the road. Yet this image of static temporality is quickly juxtaposed with that of an older woman interviewed by Ackerman who claims all has changed in Jasper, Texas since she was a child. While things might look outwardly the same, she says internally they have been irrevocably altered. The white people can't tell the black people what to do. They can legislate their own time because the very terms of property and economics have shifted given new laws and their enforcement in the wake of the civil rights movement. The landscape remains outwardly the same, true, but, after all, houses no longer belie- uh, belong to the white property owners as they once did. And so, at the very outset of Chantal's Sud, the question is posed implicitly of how we should look at and experience time and history, or more specifically, temporality and chronology, and how this relationship may be seen with respect to the possibility of change in our culture. What Ackerman's film prompts might act as a catalyst for change, allowing us to locate ourselves in some historical narrative. How can and should we orient ourselves? And now I go into a passage advisedly. But uh, for me, such a quandary posed as such brings to mind Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history, which eschews the model of chronological progress and instead looks at time as a kind of monadic structure, a chain much like the train at the start of Ackerman's film, where each era might outwardly seem the same, yet shares the same internal logic and inequities, which must be shattered. The historical materialist, he says, is one who recognizes these conditions in order to grasp how the sheen of progress might or must be set aside in order to arrive at an effective catalyst for change, for some incident allowing for another model of history to enter upon the scene. So, in looking at Sud, is Ackerman productively considered such a kind of historical materialist, working against chronological time and narrative? To answer and to arrive at her politics, it's worth, I think, considering how she deploys a sense of time in her different films. More specifically, her sense of reoriented time. Time, in other words, that's not utilitarian, even if it's seemingly innocuous in her treatment. For example, I can think of many occasions when children's play appears in her work. As a matter of fact, it's almost harder to think of one that doesn't have some instance of children's play. It's everywhere in her her oeuvre, appearing time and again regardless of any given film or installation's project or a subject. In Sud, even while a documentary about the lynching of bird, children will loll about on a swing set in a sweltering daytime heat. And this is after we've seen the very first people she depicts are occupying the time, wasting it, passing it, or enduring it. And on the other side, Ackerman's treatment of Mexican immigrants attempting to enter the United States, another one that seems to be a static or a, a static time, um, there they are again. You know, teens in the far distance seeming to dance around a football among the whirling sand of a border town's unpaved street. And then once more, and from the east, her portrait of the Eastern Bloc after the fall of the Soviet Union, their children kicking a ball on the beach, uh, likely somewhere in the Baltic states, or sledding down uh, together a small hill. I had that earlier. And then uh, Chinese youth play games amid the glowing 21st century architecture seen in her piece on Shanghai in 2007, and even Le Ba, in which Ackerman details peacetime bombing at a Tel Aviv restaurant from a rented room she almost never leaves, another kind of timelessness, uh, features imagery of children tossing a ball on the city shoreline. To extend this thought regarding Ackerman slipping out of organized time and more broadly organized history, it strikes me as being particularly relevant just how many of these scenes appear within specific fraught geopolitical settings. 
So often Ackerman places herself in border situations, whether at the foot of a long metal fence dividing Mexico and the United States, or behind the fallen Iron Curtain, the Ba too finds Ackerman wondering aloud whether her passport stamped in Israel as she passes through customs after her stay here there will subsequently allow her entry into Syria. Here's from the bedroom, again divided from the exterior. Ackerman's approach implies that one might well stand within a setting, yet never be wholly inside it. Something resides beyond the frame or exists in parallel. Her titles alone suggest as much. Things come from, or are found below, or dwell on the other side. And this, I actually think, is a backdrop, another way to think about her installation um, work of how things end up you know, being spatialized and separated, and uh, you know, seen in relation. Sued for its part suggests not only a place but also a directional, with respect to one's own place, something that exists only in relation to something else. There's the South as a noun, and a South that's Southern to your position. As a subtitle of From the East is very direct as well regarding such axes of contingency on the border of fiction. In terms of temporality portrayed by Ackerman, such politics in relation, there's the fence, which I obviously went too late because I didn't want to see it. Um, such politics in relation plays a crucial role. It's frequently observed that time is directed by culture, that any understanding of time is typically organized by a given culture situating itself at the end point of history, the vantage from which time is set in a clear sequence. Yet here again, some time always escapes and stands apart from any kind of chronological arrangement. Cinematically speaking, such decentering of perspective um, is also amplified by Ackerman's consistent use of tracking shots, even in her earliest films like this. Uh, ensued, she films a car, and I wasn't able to get an image of, of, of this film, so I went to her earlier your work. She films through a car window, one assumes as she passes slowly through the streets, effectively skimming her lens across shuttered rural downtown cross-sections, in addition to the dilapidated housing of the African-American sections in Jasper. And from the other side, along the fronts in a fenced-in, wind-blown Mexican shanties. As Peter Wallen would succinctly explain in 1969 of the technique's decimation of single-point perspective and all its implicit hierarchies, and here we would note that he was speaking about the films and theories of Bazan, uh, lateral camera movements, and this is a quote, deserted and recaptured a continuous reality. The blackness around the screen masked off the world rather than framed the image. The reality of the image on screen is continuous and ostensibly coherent, yes, but there is also inevitably something more than meets the eye. Again, to borrow Ackerman's words from Laba to articulate her ethos here, it puts things in perspective, but one perspective. In the past, I've compared such a refracted quality in her film to the painting of Courbet, Rennie of the artist Burial at Arnhem, scholar T.J. Clark, after first stating that such a canvas possesses a clear structure that's describable, quote, step by step with some kind of certainty, observes that the work has, quote, no single focus of attention, no climax towards which the forms and faces turn. So it is that the effect of reframing Ackerman produces through tracking shots might be achieved even within a single sat static frame. In Ackerman's suit, one might look again at the scene with a train passing and the car turning around and notice the man walking absent-mindedly up the street in the opposite direction. Things are heading in so many directions at once, even in this one shot. And similarly, taking stock of Ackerman's shots in sequence, one may consider the accumulated Faulknerian effect of encountering radically different perspectives of sheriff, neighbor, and family members and generations. And in fact, when you look at the film, I hope you also notice that any privileging of single point vision is also undermined as time and again in her tracking shots, people are shown clearly looking back at the camera with curiosity even waving once or twice, I think. So the filmmaker seems to view from one position among so many others. Even her documentary story, her fiction, never totally coheres except in relation. As in or non, there's a burial here, but people look in many directions in order to give it meaning. And as a result, the focus of Ackerman's suit is in many ways not an event, but a context, a societal complex, around which it might generate meaning. 
and indeed even single scenes suggest broad systemic issues. As when Ackerman focuses on prison, workers watched over by a mounted guard, there again the reality of the past inside the present, or on a clean-up crew tidying a small park. By looking away from the single subject in this way, Ackerman reminds me again of the subject she ostensibly left behind, Faulkner South, to bring up Sard on Faulkner once more, precisely regarding the author's compositional work against the chronological flow of time. Quote, in the classical novel, action involves a central complication, but we look in vain for such a complication in The Sound and the Fury. Now, earlier I mentioned the possibility of Ackerman's images of the landscape being repurposed from a study of Jo Faulkner, even if just intellectually, and in truth I have no idea whether that might be the case. But I do believe that these landscapes contribute greatly to her documentary's ambiguous temporality. The prepositional conditions of being above, below, or to the side throughout her works are man manifest here as functions of the image itself in time. In other words, they seem to stand aside from any narrative, holding open the question, are we looking at a place where something has happened or where something will happen? Are we looking at a kind of before or after the event? Or, again, you to the side. In conventional filmmaking, such images, I think, would function as establishing shots. Extended views of exteriors or interiors generating a sense of context, providing an atmosphere and indexicality in the sense of offering cues for audiences to deduce the histories of a given person or place. But here they're strangely mute, not serving as clear prompts for any specific story to unfold. Perhaps more accurately and in contrast, they suggest the potential for storytelling. An Ackerman's own vantage might be dispositional in relation. But what her viewers subsequently encounters always remains prepositional. As Ackerman has said, what I love about pictures is that each one can evoke so many things, historically, physically, philosophically, and also artistically. It's your own phantasmatic world. And just as individuals look in many directions at once, so do narrative implications, crossing paths and contradicting each other, never quite settling and cohering. And you know, the viewer, him or herself, I think, is implicated as well in this kind of disposition, which, you know, coming from the Latin means being teared apart or asunder or away etymologically. And one, I think, is, you know, finds it impossible to ignore how one brings own, one's own separate history to a place, event, or image, suffusing it with your own experience and understanding. And in this respect, I think one might finally arrive at a sense of stakes for this question of temporality and chronology, of setting a historical narrative and meaning within an ostensibly familiar landscape. But to do so and to consider temporality and such delving into history, I want to step back and look at Ackerman's work broadly with respect to developments in art and more specifically artists' use of the docu documentary mode around the time the suit was made. And as Vincennes you know, pointed out, um, yeah, I was invited in no small part you know, due to my understanding of her through a perspective of what I bring to it, as it were, you know, from an art world. Um, and we can talk about the installations uh, and the installation I made with her. Um, but I feel that the following examples happening uh, almost contemporaneously with you know, this particular work as it was being made, um, you know, create some... some you know, interesting and productive juxtapositions. In Hal Foster's essay, The Archival Impulse of 2002, shortly after Ackerman makes Sud, the art historian surveys an artistic field increasingly populated by examples of, quote, artistic practice as an idiosyncratic probing into particular figures, objects, and events in modern art, philosophy, and history. Artworks by the likes of Thomas Hirshhorn, here with Spinoza and Castle. Spinoza Pavilion in Kassel, Tacita Dean and Sam Durant, this Tacita Dean, he writes, might consist of cobbled together bits of newsprint and chaotic arrays of images on the one hand and by outmoded pieces of military and uh, technology or political slogans of bygone days on the other. All these things from the past brought into the present. In this way, Foster says, the artists were, quote, connecting what could not be connected according to the prevailing logic of the day, prompting, for example, a reevaluation of mass media images by upsetting their informational status in Hirshhorn's kiosks and asking for a reconsideration of the past as an incomplete 
project and such works as Dean and Tainmouth Electron here, which is a story about you know someone trying to sail around the world in successfully in, in a sort of a, a modern modernist ambition you know, through technology. In turn, he says, these artists suggested ways of ordering information differing from those of pre predominant conventions and ideologies, underscoring, quote, the nature of all archival materials as found yet constructed. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm finding my... Oh, I'm sorry. Really? Too fast for you? Sure, I'll slow down. Okay. Temporality, right? <laughs> okay. In the south. I, I'll introduce a drawl if you'd like me to. Okay. Hal Foster's essay, An Archival Impulse. In this way, Foster says, the artists were connecting what could not be connected according to the prevailing logic of the day, prompting, for example, a reevaluation of mass media images by upsetting their informational status in Hirshhorn's kiosks and asking for a reconsideration of the past as an incomplete project in works by Dean, such as Tainmouth Electron. In turn, these artists suggested ordering information differing from those of predominant conventions and ideologies, underscoring, quote, the nature of all archival materials as found yet constructed, factual yet fictive, public yet private. And, as Foster says, they did so from a desire to turn belatedness into becomingness. By reaching into the past and using material of failed futures, they could create the possibility for another future altogether. In short, they seek to re-narrate history, forging for it another past. And here I want to drive home that you have artists going into archival materials, the stuff of documentary, and restitching those things into a new story. And while it might be a fiction, it is a story nonetheless. Um, you're being put forward, sometimes forcefully, um, in terms of an idealist, idealistic you know, path you know, forward, and sort of even at that point in history, like a revisiting and reactivating of modernist you know, aspiration. Intriguingly, this fictive impulse, I think, would extend in subsequent years from histories of events to histories of places in real space. If decades ago we saw artists going to particular sites and teasing out their respective histories, again, site specificity in art, going to a location, discovering the past, uncovering the implicit ideologies, or like a Robert Smithson, going out to a place, um, and making something in relation to the history of that place and then bringing that back to the gallery. More recently, such sites have been handled like settings or cinematic backdrops within which other stories are introduced and allowed to unfold. Their establishing shots turn to other ends. And this historical information of a site is in some way summoned and yet withheld so that another history can be introduced and then reside within the scene. And again, in a sense, it's a site made setting. To offer one example, there's Pierre Huyghe, again, around the time of Sud. It works like Streamside des Follies, in which he sought to introduce a new history to a, free a prefabricated town in upstate New York, a town that was basically invented. And then he sought to introduce a celebration that could happen annually, so that you know, even though it was effectively out of no history, would seem like it had a history projected into the past, which they could celebrate as, as if they had always had a local you know, ritual. Looking at other examples from around the, town, the time of Ackerman Sud, one can look at the 2005 Istanbul Biennial that asked audiences to move through the city's waterfront area and among the Denise, uh, apart, Denise Palace apartments of the Beoglu district as the home of fictionalized political figures including this, which is about the arrival of modernism in uh, Istanbul. Again, you'd walk in and it would seem like a real site, only it wasn't um, somebody's apartment by any stretch. And then the following year's Berlin Biennial, 
speaking more locally, titled Of Mice and Men, made a single street into a kind of literary setting with display spaces running a themed course from life to death, placed in deteriorating apartment buildings, a ballroom, and a cemetery. And perhaps even more pertinent to Sud, such use of sight as setting was made explicit in New Orleans when artist Paul Chan commissioned a production of Waiting for Godot in the Lower Ninth Ward. Abandoning, or taking the abandoned crossroads of its landscape, all the area's houses were torn down or removed, and this is other places in the city that had been abandoned, leaving nothing but tall grass in their wake as a dead of night stage for the play. In all these instances, artists suspend the history of a location in order to insert another narrative. Historical time is, in a sense, put at a kind of pause in order to insert a different chronology or a different memory, the information within a history. With the scene left intact, and it looks the same, just given a different meaning, inserted in a different chronology. And in art, I think in previous decades, we can look at techniques like appropriation, where one thing is taken from one context into another in order for its meaning you to change. Uh, or in montage, one can see you know, other hierarchies established. But this seems like a different kind of operation that's being put forward around the time that you know, Sud is made, and with which I think, as I'll, I'll land on in closing you know, soon, you know, I, I think there's you know, something especially charged you know, to it. Um, but to make that point, first I'm going to enter into a kind of speculative mode and I hope you'll join me in the spirit of speculation, by looking at a technological model you know, through which pictures were being filtered also around the time of Sud, which was the arrival of compression, you know, compressed images and compressed you know, technology, compression algorithms. Um, to explain that a bit, you know, compression algorithms are filters, they're equations through which the information of an image is sifted in order to decrease the memory space an image occupies. These algorithms are often, or have often in the past, because they've gotten better all the time, as lossies, meaning that they are, there is information lost in the process. But the algorithm's enterprise is also poetic. They choose what information visually to discard based on what's least likely to have gone notice is missing. And then the algorithm reformats whatever details they retain to provide an imperceptibly altered version of the image or in place, you potentially like the reality of the image or reality of the space that's been made an image. Speaking metaphorically then, as artists or curators in some cases, introduce the quality of representation or of illusory space into a situation where reality remains apparently intact they summon memory, even while losing the information the site would have seemed to contain. The very word memory begins to resonate differently, pertaining more to its role as an empty vessel or container than to any information, the historical memories, that would fill it. Looking at Ackerman's landscapes, however, in her films, generally, one may see how the artist, for her part, still refuses to connect that which cannot be connected, to borrow that foster language and to look at how artists were working at that moment. The images stay at that moment before an a story is introduced or suggest another time to the side of any story she might develop. Her images are placed at an interstice, interstice between the object and her grasping of it, between her presentation and representation, projected in terms of her disposition, as it were, resisting any conclusive narrative arc. As she says in that one subtitle, her fiction resides on the border. And here, I think, the stakes and true measure of Ackerman's treatment of time become radically clear. Because what we're talking about in art and documentary is actually the stuff of our social reality. 
For the conclusion of Sud, unless the compression model I suggest seem futuristic or acronistic, Ackerman turns to an expert on white nationalism in the United States who describes how the cultural landscape is being turned even while the outward landscape looks unchanged. As this expert observes, white nationalists often enter church and s churches in small numbers, innocuously, before they increase in numbers, unannounced, taking over the locations demo democratically, realigning their institutional mission and narrative, and effectively giving the past a new narrative in turn in a manner summoning those artists making sites into settings for new stories projected into the past, they restitch the meaning of a place, leaving it outwardly the same, yet with real history lost. It is an image of itself with an internal narrative changed. And how do we keep such a chronology from taking hold, from being the story? And this is where I think a proposition is found in the long shot at the very conclusion of Sud in which the significance of location and its historical tie to a horrific event is left open, it's unspoken, but clear by virtue of duration. And viewers are prompted to do the work of recalling and inhabiting this narrative in personal relation and as contingent through the material experience of time. Almost uncannily, sorry, we conclude in his writing on The Sound and the Fury, quote, of Faulkner's heroes, they never look ahead. They face backwards as the car carries them along. Meaning that the future is foreclosed. Yet this, Ackerman suggests, cannot happen or be allowed to. By looking back materially, still seeing the potential for narrative and leaving it as potential, we might yet allow for the possibility of another future to arise. Thank you very much. So let's uh, welcome again Tim Griffin and Vincent Schrediger. Um, I, was, I was going to start a discussion with a very straightforward question. Um, to set up the question, it's important to know how we organize these series. We invite the people that we want to have as speakers and we ask them for a list of three preferences of films so as to allow us to juggle a bit with the, with the program. Um, but of all the many, many films of uh, uh, Chantal Ackermann, this was your first pick. So my question would have been, why this film now? But in a way, it's a question that probably answers itself. Uh, but you can address it if you want. Um, instead, I just want to move straight to the analysis that you pre presented or the argument that you presented about the, the spatiality and the spatial character of, of memory and, and history. Um, I don't know if you would accept this as a proper summary of your talk, but but one could say that you built it around three movements, or maybe four movements, uh, starting off with the movement of the train, with the separate cars, where which are sort of allegories of epochs or boxes of history that travel past. But there's also a discontinuity um, in the seemingly continuous movement. Um, uh, there are the lateral travelings, which we know from other films from from Ackermann, uh, which sort of disclose the space, the living space. Um, uh, depth of space is very important in those travelings through the streets. And then there's the first uh, travelling with the camera at the back of the car of the street where the incident happened or where the murder happened. And then, of course, the final traveling, which, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb, is one of the most haunting, if not the most haunting, traveling shots in the history of cinema. Um, uh, so, 
your argument partly was about, I mean, you cited Benjamin about the look back and, and uh, the impossibility of disclosing the future in this film. Um, can you probably start from the ending again and, and comment again on that final shot and uh, what, where, where it figures in your argument? I, I think that when it comes to when it comes to the argument grandly, and then I I might want to attempt uh, an answer of both questions the the normal question that you put forward, and then the the broader question about you know things is that uh, I think in her work there is continually a kind of pause you know, put forward in terms of you know, what the narrative is, how it fits into a chronological sequence. And you know, through the ways in which time sort of falls away and creates other little pockets and separations, um, you know, she you know, calls into question how we you know, create a kind of fiction, even if like every history is a kind of fiction. And what ends up being... I think you what ended up being um, especially important about that shot is that in that sense of about a pause, it's a pause that lasts about seven minutes, and time becomes pliable, uh, material, contingent in the way in which even as as like it's a haunting shot, but it's haunting partly because the street's being used still. The street's being used, you know that. Yeah, in a, in a fact, you are kind of forgetting is happening. It will be a lot less effective without the two cars passing. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and so, like the fact that it's not being memorialized, that you know, as the shot unfolds, there's other kinds of time you know, unfolding, you know, unfolding within it, that really lays a kind of responsibility. You know, at the feet of the watcher and of the maker and knowing how it is still just one you know, point of view ends up, I think, being a very different proposition than saying, okay, this is what happened and this is how you should read it and this is how it's understood in history and how we want something like that to be memorialized so that you can move you know, through it and, and beyond it. And so, you know, in, in terms of the opening discussion I, I had about this, you know, referring to the Benjamin is, you know, and at that point, you know, obviously he's writing, you know, the onset of fascism, um, that, you know, that illusion of progress, that notion of progress allows one to abdicate a kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that idea that time is unfolding, you know, that it, you know, that there is a move that's simple from one point to the other through history is, um, is something that you know, he seeks to move against in that essay, and which I think is relevant here. And you know, for me, then to go to the question of, okay, so why this film? I mean, it's sort of odd because I think you wrote me, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think I um, you responded almost, and I'll just admit this, like almost formally, where I was, so I wrote back quickly, um, or at least I saw the email, and when I saw it, I wrote back quickly, and you know realized that in some sense I was responding to the formal aspects of the film, you know where I feel like it is such a tautly made thing, and distills so many of her cinematic techniques that it was something that I realized okay this is like crystalline this is it, and then what became amazing when I said, okay, let me sit down and watch this again, is how you know, this question of history you know, ends up being, I mean, it's utterly, it's staggering, you know, in terms of the event, but in terms of not only the problems socially that speak so much to today, but then when it comes to, you know, the discussion of white nationalism and the Aryan state and, you know, the techniques of infiltration that happen there ends up having, I think, everything to do with the kinds of technological and narrative developments being dealt with by artists, you know, and and which now we see, yeah, you know, that being manifested in in um, 
in real space and within a social a social network, which even now when it comes to you know elections is being you know, in the, in terms of the re narrativizing and the restaging of political events, you know, so that you know, our understanding of them is sort of turned in advance of our experience of them. That sort of topsy turviness of you know what a historical event is made this film just you know speaking you know to use the language i use in so many directions you know at once that it, it ended up being incredibly eloquent and and you know moving i mean you quoted martin luther king the famous thing about the arc of of history being long but bending towards justice that final shot really undermines that belief yeah i don't yeah no i mean i i, I added that as a rhetorical flourish because right. we all want to believe that I, well, <laughs> yeah. not everybody wants to believe and that obama obviously. quoted it a lot <laughs> but, yeah. but it's it's you know it, it's it's important you know as a as a rhetorical it, it's something important to bring up as you know a question and one way of looking at our contemporary moment and realizing again what the stakes are in mm. terms of our understanding of history in order to you know, enact change in some way. I'm sure we have questions from the audience. Yes, please. Yeah, Fina, um, go ahead. I'd like to um, ask something or maybe say something about the camera. I'm not entirely sure if it's going to turn out to be a question or a comment. Um, so I was really wondering a lot about the presence of the camera and by extension the politics of its presence and of her presence as well. Um, you said at the beginning that you felt that there was a looking back at the camera um, and I think you said with curiosity um, and I felt like there was also a talking back to the camera uh, specifically in the tracking shots from the car when people are actually also saying something about why are you filming me, stop filming me, go away um, and in those shots but also in a different one I felt that the camera was quite an imposition um, and by extension her presence was an imposition and I felt that even more strongly in the memorial scene where um, the camera was so central and so in the middle of the um, of everything that was happening um, and I was also kind of wondering because the camera does become very present and very visible in watching the film specifically because of, for example, the looking back aspect, um, but the presence of the white person behind the camera and possibly the white crew, if there was one, um, does not become visible in the film. And I was wondering, isn't that something in this context where race is the central um, sort of marker of difference that's um, under investigation? Um, isn't that something that should have happened? And isn't this sort of... Uh, in position something that should have also been in some manner um, discussed uh, in the film or shown in the film in a different manner. Uh, so I guess I'm kind of questioning also your understanding of is this curiosity or is it maybe also, uh, is there also resentment or even resistance to the camera? Yeah, I mean, uh, good question. I'm in agreement with a lot of what you're saying. Um, I think that... Yeah, definitely. As I as I wrote this, I, I tuned into certain moments, and this time I heard, you know, what you heard, which is one fellow say, "Don't do that. You can't. You, you got to stop. You can't." You, you know, I guess by implication, which is not to explain away your question, because I think what you say just persists. But she is definitely in the social setting. She's not pretending to be outside of it, and. In that way, she is implicated. You know, she definitely, the camera is not somehow outside or trying to make this thing cohere uh, as if she was containing it wholly. And you know, again, you know, what, what is you know, potentially interesting, you know, one thing that is interesting about this is even if you look at performance in contemporary art, just to offer a perspective, so often your performance now is being put on as if it were like a picture. You know, as opposed to you know the action happening with somebody in the same you know space uh, and so I do think that there is 
I'm not sure how she would have accounted you know, for herself in terms of you know, making herself present you know, before the camera. Uh, I'm not sure how that would have affected things, but I do think that there is some implication there. I do also think, looking back at this, that you know, I have asked myself, if she were an American white person, would she have been allowed in at all? You know, into you know, definitely some of these situations. The fact I think that she is French and came off as an outsider, even when you know, within the scene, gave her a kind of access that she might not have otherwise you know had. Um, I do know anecdotally that I remember one time, and I don't know. If, I'll just offer an anecdote. Um, one time I visited her in her, her apartment um, because of, as we were working on a project and as it happened, she had invited like eight repair people of different sorts you know, in to do work on the apartment. And as she, as these things were being done, she was filming them all, each one of them. She was just filming everything, but she was filming them as they came in and talking about politics. This was the Romney Obama um you know, uh, election. And of course, I think as a matter of policy, they couldn't say anything or they wouldn't say anything. But there was um, an imposition of the self. Like they were in her domestic environment, but she was imposing herself, you know, upon them. And I think that that imposition, not to generate a resp not, not not to provoke, but to activate the social sphere, the social sphere, um, when so often, and definitely in the United States, there's like a shutting down of that um, by manner of being polite um, is something that she might work against. Or maybe to land on that you know, just a little bit more succinctly, she, imp you know, she implicates herself in these scenes, and yet by virtue of being where she's from, she's weirdly absent within the American psyche. Um, one uh, particular configuration or stylistic element that's repeated throughout the film, I think there are three or four instances, is where you have a landscape shot and street noises in the background. Uh, and usually in any film where you have street noises in the background, you end up seeing the car or seeing the traffic. And not here. So there's, a, there's sort of a, um, a disposition. Uh, between the sonic space and and the visual space, and between the landscape and and the movement on the soundtrack, and that movement on the soundtrack is really important. How do you read these? Uh, yeah, it's it's funny. I I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I think for weirdly to try to keep the the paper on track, I didn't pick up on the sound, but the levels are really you're pretty radically off in this, in terms of the ambient and contextual sound being really up you know, the entire time. So you are always thinking about what else is happening. Like those insects are really loud you know, throughout you know, as well. But yeah, I, I mean, except for I would agree that it's one more thing. You're suggesting there's something outside of the frame that you're not really containing or, or you know, being able to um, you know, evaluate for yourself. I mean, just just in, in let's put it this way: conventional psychoanalytic terms or the, the terms of psychoanalytic film theory, there will be a tension because these are sort of uh, uh, acousmetric sounds. You know, they're they're not embodied, and and so they, they, there's um, uh, it becomes uncanny too, um, and and there's a power differential, if you will, that that opens up through this disposition of sound and, and image. And that brings me back to the one shot where we see a direct gestural performance of white supremacy, which is the prison guard on the horse. Uh, that, is, that is a, a very haunting shot, particularly because of the deliberate slowness of the gait of the horse and, and the way he sort of, I mean, this is a lazy man. Uh, <laughs> you just sit there and you watch this happening 
and and see him on the horse. This comes after the the the, the old lady telling us about the lynching scene where uh, two black men were shot down from a horse for their presumed arrogance and lynched. And then we see this guy uh, up on a horse, and it's sort of a a replay of it. But it's the only instance where where the the the, the racial power structure actually comes into view. Um, and and so I, w- I was wondering if you'd... You know, and that yeah. on the on some matter, you know, on some simple, you know, in a simple way, you know, nothing systemically has changed, you know, at all. Yeah. You know, that you know, the things that made that scene possible all remain in in place. And you know, it you know, maybe I, I speak as a a northern white man. Um, you know, it it looks uncanny. You know, where it looks like it's no, this couldn't possibly you know, be. Ha- I mean, I, I'm overplaying it but you know it obviously you know, it it looks like a figure from you know, the past but there it is plain as day you know in, in place so I, I do think that it's like a powerful evocation of the question of, of time yes Ulf please uh, from your point of view there should be a difference or probably is a difference between film and video and uh, right and i had the impression that this is actually a video and it's a video from a time when maybe technically it wasn't the um you know it wasn't still the original video it was probably a sort of a dvd or a webcam and now we could do this in much, much better quality with any iPhone. Um, so it's sort of stuck in the middle technically. And actually this is being seen in the middle ground mostly where things seem to shift a little and are not quite focusing. Um, d- d- from your point of view, what does this aesthetically mean to you, or is it just a compromise on the side of the filmmaker because it couldn't be otherwise, couldn't have been otherwise made? I think that I, I completely agree that it has an in betweenness yet to it. I think that, um, you know, the in betweenness works for and against it in that way, where on the one hand, you know, it has a new portability that allows a mobility and as you pointed out, lets her get really close and in the scene in a way that might not you know, otherwise you know, be possible. And then on the other hand, you know, while I think the editing is you know, pretty remarkable, um, it bespeaks you know, a quick and dirty you know, approach in, in many ways. You know, uh, I think that you know, there are Obviously, through duration, for example, that last shot is amazing, but it's not an exquisite scene. There's like something idiomatic and vernacular about it, you know, which thinking back, I wonder is still like the, the technology, even such as it is, is still out of reach of you know, many you know, people in terms of the economics of the thing. So it is a little bit you know, specialized, but on the other hand, it really you know, it's beginning to approximate you know, even in the economics of the thing, um, uh, video making that is of the social sphere, you know, like it's a little bit too expensive for many people, but on the other hand, it's not art, you know, in, in terms, it's not cinema, you know, it, it has, you know, more of a a common vernacular, to it if I may um, add a sort of a footnote but it's also a question and you can um, uh, elucidate this uh, further um, I would assume this was filmed on DigiBeta um, with a relatively small portable camera which was still considered to be television capable at the time I mean if you look at the credits it's an RT production and it was it was broadcast on <clears throat> on RT. Uh, so twenty years ago, this was uh, considered to be a satisfactory image quality for for certainly cultured television. Um, apparently, 
uh, and now it, 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 you're absolutely right. You can go to uh, Media Markt, and uh, if you have 1,200 euros, you can buy a camera that make that that produces a much better image quality than this. Now it's 2K or even 4K, um, but uh, the, by the television standards of the time, that was a sufficient image quality. But then the artifact that it generates, uh, of course, adds a layer of meaning. Um, that that I think is worth uh, thinking about. I don't know if you agree with that. No, I mean, the, the only thing I might add, because I think you're you're going to be more on top of that than me, but um, is yeah, your question really still stays with me? Uh, and a, a further question, you know, subsequent to it, you know, is maybe tied to this: is who is this documentary for? You know, ultimately, who is the audience that this is meant to be you know, distributed to? And you know, not that we would, I mean, she made the piece, you know, it, it, it can land where it lands. But, you know, how was this contextualized for the people she was you know, working with? And did they see it? And what were they hoping for, you know, you know from it? Um, you know, that's that's a, a sort of matrix of circumstances that, you know, remains unclear to me. Maybe in, in, in defense of her imposing her, I'm not offering a defense of her imposing herself on those particular social situations, but uh, there's an element of veracity to it in the sense that she doesn't edit it, edit that material out. Uh, she documents the tension. And uh, you, you could have smoothed this over. You know, you could have created the suggestion that she was a welcome witness in that community, and and uh, she clearly doesn't suppress that evidence. And I didn't mean you know, by you know, using the term imposition. In, in I'm not I'm not incredibly anxious uh, about it yeah. you know, in in this particular instance. But I, I do know that even just working with her over time in a situation where there are so many people, like even in the building of the kitchen, who didn't mm. know her, by the end of her time there, everyone was confessing everything to her. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. They knew that my staff better than I did. And yeah, yeah. Somebody broke up. She goes, don't worry, it wasn't meant to be. It was, you know, she was... Yeah, in her, in her last New York film, Juliette Binoche played a psychiatrist, of course. A psychotherapist was called The Couch in New York. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Comedy. We have, you know, we call, I mean, it's we the couch of the kitchen we called the Ackerman because she was always asleep on it. Uh -huh. She couldn't sleep in her hotel and always just stayed there okay. you know, all the time. And, uh, yeah, she got to know everybody. Pro pro probably a reference to that. <laughs> well, again. Oh, well, I'm glad you commented on the um, imposing thing because I don't think she imposes herself on, on anybody at all. She's simply a documentary artist. And this is what you do. You hold the camera at where there is something to see. And who cares if anyone shouts back, don't, don't put your camera toward me. You know, this is just part of the big narrative that people shout. That's all. It has nothing to do with imposing yourself on anybody so this is really sorry the question that came from the back this is this is really for me this is our times it's 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 creating a case of bad conscience uh, the the bad conscience is supposed to be on the side of the maker for making something for making something visible for making something clear. Now, how would we ever look at documents if there aren't courageous documenters documenting things? You want to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, all right. I'd still say it's an imposition. I'd say any choice of putting a camera on anything is a kind of imposition. Um, it doesn't, I don't necessarily mean to argue that an imposition is always something that has only negative connotations. And I think that's something that you were also sort of um, getting at. Um, but I think it's something that if you're making a specific argument within a film, um, and especially in relation to a topic like that, 
um, where the politics is very, I mean, the politics is always central, but the politics here um, is very much the focus. So um, if you are making a film like that, I think you have to account for it, for that imposition. Um, and what I meant was also not that she, um, in making the film, does not account for her presence at all. I d also didn't mean to separate the camera from her that much. Um, and you're right, Vincent, she doesn't edit it out. But unless you know her, n her name and who she is, uh, you can still watch this film and not think about the fact of whiteness behind the camera. And I think that's the key bit that I'm interested in. And I think it also, uh, if we think about who, um, who in the film, in terms of the sort of n n verbal narration, uh, who are the characters um, who get to tell the quote unquote facts? It's a white journalist and a white expert on white supremacy. Uh, Sheriff, maybe not so much because he's not that eloquent a person really, but otherwise, um, we still have the kind of facts from white people and then um, we have more of a storytelling vernacular mode, um, which again, I'm not necessarily arguing that she hierarchizes that so strongly, but I still think there's aspects of how this, well, just racial tension, these racial issues um, come, up, come up in the film that is not just fully discussed it's just kind of there and maybe that's also a strength of the film that it kind of leaves a bit of that up to um, the spectators to think about more um, but I think in some ways her own whiteness is not addressed and I'm questioning whether that is not something um, that should have been addressed in some way which I'm not saying she she's not allowed to make the film because she's white that's not what I'm saying but specifically this what you said outsider status as not a white American, but a white person from Europe. Um, also, I think maybe works within the memorial scene where obviously she's introduced to people, but then once she's in the car, she does get this talking back because people might assume her to be white American, right? So I just think it's a lot to sort of just think about and keep in mind. I didn't mean to say uh, she shouldn't have made the film. Can I add a little observation to that? Since you said that the, the authorities that explain the story and explain the context are all white. Um, I don't know if you agree with this, but I would say that the, 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 the narrative key event in the scene is the funeral. And the, the key speaker is the guy who's the head of the Chamber of Commerce and also a family friend, who's in fact the most articulate person in the whole film. Uh, who uh, gives a political reading of what happened uh, from the point of view of a black community leader. And then you have the sister and, and the niece um, performing the song and, and the memorial in a way. And you could say that that is the, the point where, where, the, where the victim is evoked in the most specific fashion, but the memory is also clearly politically framed from a black community point of view. And and that's pretty much the middle piece of the film. I don't know in terms of timing, but... but um. For me, the only thing I might add in which you became... Something I thought about you know, while watching it you know, this time is that the first person to tell the story you know, in its ostensible wholeness is the journalist. And he looks miserable. You know, he looks utterly anxious in a way where he knows that he's not telling the whole story. And it almost, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to ascribe, some, I, I hate ascribing something like this, but, uh, because it's a cliche, but it was almost like a confession um, in how he was you know, putting it. It was a confessional. Like, he didn't want to tell the story. He didn't want to go through it. He was scratching his face the whole time. Uh, he, he really had no interest in you know, beginning or finishing this story. And you know, that anxiety and what is unsaid you know, becomes as important as anything that is said. And so like something is being left out you know, of this. If I may add a little uh, other little observation to that, uh, that particular scene, what, is, what seemed to me to be significant is that he tries to adopt sort of an, an official 
bureaucratic Plus no piece of it. Yeah. language to, to distance, to, to keep it at a certain distance, but it breaks down in the end. Like in the last phrase, the, that kind of language fails him. And, and he starts to express what he really feels uh, and, and, and sort of changes the register of language, becomes more colloquial, uh, more direct, because the, all the correct circumscriptions uh, uh, fail him. But it, it's true. I mean, uh, it's, it's a key moment uh, also in terms of, you know, uh, the breakdown of the official narrative of that. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great moment to illustrate what you were, were talking about in terms of discontinuity of, of histories and historical experience, because this is really, I mean, whatever his attitude is, it's difficult to see where he stands, or, but he's visibly uh, uneasy uh, telling the story, but this is a, a breakdown moment. It's, it's a moment where something completely collapses, and you could see that there's a, an official version, there's a mask, or if Billy has his nameplate square in front of him. Yeah. <laughs> and he mechanism. comes up with the famous economic anxiety argument, you know. So, yeah. Yes. Do we have any more questions or comments at this point? Yes, please. Can you can you please use the microphone? Sorry. No, it's just the way I saw the film. To me, um, a very mo mo um, moving moment was um, right before the final scene when there's this black um, neighbor or I don't know this person. It was a sort of eyewitness. He he was. Yes. He saw the car. It, it was somebody who was close. And um, what what reached me was that he um, actually also I'm I'm not a native speaker so the way I kind of understood the scene was that he didn't express himself very like easily, but at the same time to me it was very eloquent and very um, like pointing at what had happened, and so to me this was a very important and very um, strong part of the film actually. narrative is disjointed you know it goes from watching tv to i mean even like from sent sentence to sentence you know he mixes up the order of how the evening unfolded in terms of you know what he asked his son to do when the son went to sleep when he stopped when he went to sleep himself when he watched the western when he no, it was the final like very very end of the film very very end it's just because he appears two times i think or three times yeah. twice like, that was um, in its directness you know, incredible very credible <laughs> well he's definitely not putting on a linguistic mask if you will uh, different from the journalist whose mask breaks down and the sheriff who you know is unflappable and tells us he still us doesn't talk I mean he doesn't talk about how he feels about it the sheriff and, uh, the, like, in that scene. yes yeah. Doesn't I, he's obviously horrified by it, but he doesn't he doesn't explain himself. Yeah. He, he doesn't go into his feelings about it. Yes. And then we go into the last shot thinking about the pieces of flesh on the road. One should never underestimate the contribution of Claire Atherton to these films, the editor, just in terms of timing and in terms of organizing these kinds of transitions. Um, it looks simple and intuitive, but it's very, very powerful. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Tim, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation, for a great discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming, and see each other next Thursday.